The following is a presentation of the Matt Talk Podcast Network. You are now tuned in to the PA Power Podcast, College Edition, featuring Rob Waldco and Joe Youngblood. PA Power Wrestling. PA Power Wrestling. Pennsylvania is wrestling. Welcome in to the open room with Rob and not Joe. It's going to be Jeff today, Rob. It's uh, Jeff Upson had to step in for Joe Youngblood because, you know, it's the holiday season. And when you have uh, nine kids and, and a wife, I guess uh, it pulls you away from wrestling. Yeah, I think Joe's really shown that he's all about the money with what Jeff pays us. Um, instead of doing his job, he's going on a fancy vacation. So uh, luckily we had Jeff coming here to save the day and you know we still talk about some college wrestling yeah i mean i still i still follow a lot of college wrestling obviously i mean it's you don't stop watching college wrestling um you know once once high school wrestling is is over so we have a a lot to cover in this episode in fact we're gonna joe's gonna rejoin us and we're gonna have an interview with zeke jones um so that that should be a, a pretty pretty intense interview with zeke um and we're going to talk a little bit about some of the holiday tournaments coming up such as the midlands and the the scuffle uh but first rob let's open it up with the wilkes open uh and this is one i know you're familiar with here but i when i was looking through the results i noticed that some of lehigh's bigger studs have returned to lineup because we've talked about in the past how lehigh's just been really banged up uh, not having all their starters in. But if you look at the Wilkes Open results, Luke Karam is back in the lineup. He won it at 141 pounds. Court Schuyler as well at 149 pounds. He's won it at 149, beating Jimmy Hoffman in the final 7-4. Yeah, it was good to see those guys come back. Obviously, uh, Lehigh has not been at full strength this year. They've had a lot of their guys that coming into the year you thought would be starters and big contributors not in there. So I think it's good for those guys to get in there and shake the dust off. Uh, also at 184, uh, Ryan Price made his return to the lineup, and he beat teammate Chris Weiler, uh, who's down, I guess, at 84 now, which makes sense. When you look at their lineup, they have a bit of a log jam at 97 with Gentili, Jacobson, Weiler. Uh, it makes sense that one of those guys would go down. Uh, maybe not for this year. I think Price probably has a stranglehold on that that spot, but... You know, moving forward next year, they're going to need someone at 184. And do you think that's a good move, Rob? I mean, to bring Weiler down. I mean, this is a guy who was round of 12, right? I mean, he was pretty close to becoming an All-American. And, um, you know, he drops down to 84, maybe a more natural fit for him to kind of set in the wings to, to take over for Price. Do you, do you like that move by, you know, the Lehigh coaching staff? I do, and here's why. Because if something happens at 197, he can always go back up. I think it tells us right now that Jacobson probably has a stranglehold on the spot. Um, he's going down to 84, like he said, his more natural weight. If Price gets hurt, he can insert himself. If Jacobson gets hurt, he can always go back up. So it gives them a little bit more flexibility. And with, I guess, their luck the last couple of years with injuries, it probably makes sense to, to plan that way. Yeah, well, it's it's just nice to see that those Lehigh wrestlers are getting back into the lineup because I know for for a long time we're thinking, you know, when are they back? When are they back? And it's it's nice to see them finally come back. Now, Rob, they're going to be heading down south, correct, for the the holiday? Yeah, they will be in South Beach. Uh, the South Beach Duels, I think it's in its second or third year. Honestly, it looks like a really, really good tournament. More ranked guys there than I think even at the Midlands or the Scuffle. And you look at Lehigh, they're going to wrestle some top teams. I think we had talked about this on their preview or maybe week one or two in the season. Lehigh is not attending any really big tournaments this year. Rather, they're wrestling some very big duels. Um, for instance, when they get down there, they're going to wrestle Minnesota, Missouri, North Carolina, and Virginia. So, the, you know, their starters are going to get four pretty tough matches right off the bat there, um, spread over two days. So maybe it's a little bit easier on the body versus you lose early somewhere like the Midlands or the Scuffle when you're battling back, and you, know, you might wrestle seven or eight matches. And looking at some of the matchups there, I mean, there could be some some hammer matchups, especially when you look at Minnesota. I'm thinking Jordan Wood and Gable Stevenson. I know those two have wrestled quite often in freestyle, which Gable has, has dominated that, and especially we've seen what Gable's been, been doing to competitions this year. But talk about some of those matchups that we could potentially see uh, w- with some big-name Pennsylvania guys. Yeah, right off the top, I think the big – Big weight class is 141. Uh, Karam is going to face uh, McKee, Ironman, Headley, and Crivis. So he's going to face four quality top 20 guys right there. I think it makes sense to head up to Wilkes, get the rust off, because certainly you don't want your first match of the year to be versus McKee or Ironman. Um, outside of that, some of the matches I'm looking forward to, you got Daniel Lewis and Cutler. 
You know, two All-Americans, two really strong guys, good on top. Lewis looks really good. He wrestled very well in Vegas, but you know Cutler's a bull. Um, like you said, Wooden Stevenson's a big one. Uh, Ryan Price versus Chip Ness. Yeah. Uh, of course, yeah, Ness has been an All-American before. Uh, he's up and down. He just beat Taylor Venz. Didn't wrestle that well out in Vegas, but Price is yet to, to All-American. That's a big match for him. It's a big match for seeding. And then at 97, you get Jacobson and then Aiello from uh, Virginia, who's been pretty hot. So, you know, good match or a good chance for Aiello to kind of step out there and see what he's got. And then, of course, you know, you'll have Cam Coyne in the mix as well, um, see what he does for Virginia up at 165. You know, I, I like the the South Beach duels here. I mean, because who, who wants to go to, you know, uh, the cold northeast during the winter, right? Who? Why would you not want to go down to somewhere where it's warm, get a little vacation in, while you're wrestling, you know, like you said, it's spread over across two days. So um, I, I agree. I like that. And I think it's it's growing. I, I've heard more college coaches talking about that uh, in in the off season about going down there and competing. So looking forward to, to that and seeing how Lehigh does against some of those top teams. The other tournament that's going to be going on is the Midlands, right? And this is this is the big one. This is I don't know what year it is, but it's it's definitely up there in the years. Um, Midlands always one that I, I look forward to to seeing how Pennsylvania wrestlers do. That's going to be on Saturday and Sunday, December twenty eighth and twenty ninth. Um, and Midlands, you look at it this year, and I, I think. You know the numbers, maybe uh, in terms of rankings, maybe aren't as as high as they have been in years past, but still a quality tournament, Rob, and and one that we're going to keep a close eye on. Absolutely, it's you know the Midlands is never easy because you always have Iowa there, you always have Northwestern there, Illinois is always there. Um, it seems like Arizona State likes going to that, so you're always going to have some quality guys. You know, maybe not the Penn States, the Ohio States, but. You know, Ohio State sending their reserves. They're saying Nathan Tomasella at 133. So there's going to be some top tier wrestling. Yeah, I, I when I saw that that NATO was going to to Midlands at 133, I thought, man, that's that's exciting to see how he can do in the in that mix. Um, and as you said, I was there, uh, Arizona State, who we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit later with with Zeke Jones. But just looking at the the ranked wrestlers here at Midlands, of course, we'll start off at 125 in Spencer Lee, where he uh, had sort of a breakout tournament last year. He did lose to Ronnie Bresser um, and then had a medical uh, default out of that tournament, but you look at the the field this year, and of course Sebastian Rivera, uh, probably one of the hottest wrestlers. I think he's he's, I think he's gotten so much better than he he was last year at this time. I, I really do think that he's he's improved greatly, and I think he's going to keep it close with Spencer. Honestly, I, I really do think it. If these two uh, face off in the finals, I think they'll probably keep it close. I agree. Uh, you know, there's some other landmines in there. Yep, uh, notably Pat Glory. I think it is really good. I think he's going to be pushing for an All-American spot. I don't think he beats Lee, but maybe he pushes Rivera. Uh, Ryan Milhoff, you know, former All-American, hasn't looked great, honestly, the last two years. But, um, you know, I, he's got a lot of stuff. Like, he's good on top. He's pretty funky. He's not an easy out. Honestly, I don't think Milhoff or Glory can push Lee. I think Rivera can. But those other guys can maybe get in the mix with Rivera, maybe knock him off, and possibly make it for an easier final for Lee. Um you, know, you look at Lee's results, he's pounded glory. He beat Rivera pretty bad up at the Big Tens last year, but the dual meet it was close. And like Jeff said, Rivera's looked very good. Um, he's got great conditioning. He wrestles very, very hard. So that's a good match to see You know where Spencer's at because last time we did see Spencer, uh, he didn't look great. I don't know if he was under the weather or what, but you know, he'll certainly be tested here. Yeah, and this is really one of his first big tests of the year would be Midlands. And as you said, in, in the duel with, with Iowa State, you know, not necessarily uh, looked his best, uh, came out hot and uh, you know, sort of faded a little bit. Rivera, obviously, that was close in the duel, but then Spencer separated in Big Tens because, I mean, he just wrestled a, an unbelievable uh, February March. However, um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see how this this weight pans out, and I wouldn't be surprised to see it leave Rivera and Glory uh, top one, two, and three. You look at 133 pounds, and of course, Austin Asano from Iowa is there. Um, he comes in as, as the number 11th ranked wrestler, and He's been up and down, right, a little bit. And uh, Seth Gross is the returning national champion. He's the top seed there. But, of course, Nathan Tomasello, I mean, he, he's – talk about a landmine. <laughs> he's kind of a big one. Yeah, you know, looking at Gross and Tomasello, and these guys aren't from Pennsylvania, obviously, but that was a match that I kind of feel like we got cheated out of. Like, we never got to watch them wrestle whenever Tomasello was at 33 and Gross was at 33. Obviously, Corey Clark beat Tomasello in the semifinals. And then went back down to 25. So I always wanted to see that one. 
obviously, we have to see if Gross is out there. He hasn't wrestled a ton this year. He's battling a back injury. But I think those guys are the clear one, too. I'd be surprised if DeSanto knocked one of them off, but obviously he's never an easy out. One of the biggest matches that I, I'm looking forward to, if, if it happens, is uh, Mikey Carr, right, from, from Illinois, and South Fayette native, uh, and Max Murin from, from Iowa, the Central Cambria native. And these two, I mean, I, I love the way Murin wrestles. I, and I know, Rob, we've talked about this throughout the season, but Murin is just a goer. He, he's he's a, a just a solid, and I think he's gotten so much better um, from from that high school, I really think we, we've seen that transition from him develop into a, a quality wrestler at the Division One level. Um, but of course, you have Tristan Moran in there as well, uh, Brian Lantry, Josh Albert. So it, it's a full field. But Mikey Carr and Max Murin, I'd love to see them wrestle. Yeah, I think Murin actually beat him at the Midlands last year while he was on red shirt. And Carr, he's had kind of a weird year. He, he's lost to Ironman twice and then didn't wrestle. So he lost to Ironman in the duel. Didn't wrestle till Cliff Keen lost to Ironman in the semis of Cliff Keen, defaulted out. So hoping he's okay. I know Lantry was battling an injury. He just came back, uh, I think, at their last dual meet, but was out for about a month. But honestly, looking at this, you know, if I'm looking at the big three, I, I think Carr, Murin, and then Albert, you know, toss him in a bag, see who comes out on top. Um, maybe Murin or Moran, excuse me, maybe throw him in there. But I think those three are, are kind of the, t- uh, I guess, class of the weight. And 149, Rob, this is this is a weight where uh, you may not see him on the rankings, but you're probably going to see him in the brackets. And I think you, you said that Ohio State announced that, that Sammy Sasso will be going to the Midlands. Talk about a, a landmine. He, Sammy Sasso, I think, can re- – now, of course, he's on redshirt this year at Ohio State as a true freshman, but I think he can really mix it up with some of these top guys like Pat Lugo, Max Thompson, um, and even Josh Maruka. You look at the, the other guys here, Anthony Artelona, right, from Penn. This is a guy he's battled back and forth in, in Fargo and, and who's number one. Um, the, these guys are very familiar with each other. But I, I really like the, the chances of Sasso doing well here. I can't wait to see him do it. Um, but Maruka, you know, kind of, I mean, sitting there at the number 14 ranked wrestler in the nation, is, does he have enough to really beat some of these top quality guys? He's always in the mix, but does he have enough to really beat a ranked opponent? Yeah, first starting with Sasso, it'll be interesting to see where they place him in the bracket. He's wrestled one quality guy, like high quality guy this year, which is his teammate Micah Jordan, and lost nine to seven. Besides that, he's kind of rolled through everyone. But we know the talents there. I'm excited to see where he's at. I think Kolodzik is too much for him, but you know I'll go out on a limb. I think Sasso is competitive with anyone else in the weight. Uh, to Maruka, yeah, he's for whatever reason hasn't completely broken through, but isn't an easy matchup for anyone. Um, it will be interesting to see how he where he goes. I think. You know, just the way they're wrestling, I think he could go with Heil, um, Max Thompson, Lugo. Like, those guys aren't terrible matchups for him. Like, they're kind of slower, plotting guys, which I think caters to him a little bit better versus those really explosive athletic guys that can get to his legs, pick it up quick, and finish. Um, so we'll see. I mean, Artelona, he's in the mix. He, I don't think he's lost yet this year. Um, or no, he lost, excuse me, to Fine Silver at the Keystone Classic. But besides that, has been on fire. And... Yeah, you have eight ranked guys plus Sasso, so there's going to be a lot of fireworks in this weight for sure. You move up to 157 pounds, and you have the number two ranked wrestler in the nation, Ryan Deacon, Larry Early from Old Dominion's not four, but Caleb Young comes in at number seven. Um, I like Caleb Young. I think a lot of people in Iowa are excited about his uh, trajectory and how he's been doing this year. Um, but, of course, I look at here as well, and you have Zach Hartman from Bucknell, uh, who's, who's ranked 20th in the, the nation. Um, talk about this weight, Robin, where you think Young and, and maybe even Hartman can, can end up. So I think Young, looking at this, is probably the second or third best guy. I think he can wrestle with Larry Early. I think Deacon is a mile ahead of everyone in this weight. I called him out before Vegas. I think he's a stud. He's really good at this weight class. He's got a high motor, and he can finish his leg attacks. I think it's going to be too much for anyone here. Uh, to Hartman. Hartman just lost an overtime match to Romani from Pitt. Obviously has a win over Smythe from Buffalo this year. Um, beat the Michigan State, beat the Indiana starters at the Navy Classic. Hartman's looking good. You know, you look over this, you got Barone, Pedaleo, Wyland. I think he's in the mix with those guys. I think Young early beat him early in the year. Those guys are probably a little bit too much for him right now, but I expect Hartman to be probably top five or six in this weight class. I expect Young 
you know, barring injury defaults, a lot of things happen at these. I think he's probably third, maybe fourth. Yeah, I, I like I like Young uh, being in the, that top that top four. I agree with you, Rob. Deacon's sort of a mile ahead, and, and I agree with you when you said that he sort of has a, a you know a, a good good season this year at 157 pounds. I, I just think he's everything. Ever since the summer, I was really high on him as well. You move up to 165 pounds, Rob, at the Midlands, and of course Evan Wick is is there sitting at the number two ranked position. But Josh Shields, number 12 in the nation, he's there as well from Arizona State. Uh, I mean, I, I saw him at against Penn State, uh, Vincenzo Joseph. He, you know, he had a, a not a good match against him. But where can he end up here, especially with some you know high quality guys? I think he's you know looking at the weight, he's top four, no question. You look at the guys below him, Gunther, uh, Verrett from Brown. They're, they're quality guys, national qualifiers, but they're not quite his talent level. He lost to Wick 5-4 to four at the uh, Southern Illinois. I don't remember the exact name of it, their their tournament that they had. So he's right there with Wick. Uh, you throw him in the mix, he could beat Styart. He can beat Marinelli. Can he beat both of them back-to-back? I don't know. Um, but he's there. I mean, he's not going to get blown up by anyone here. I think he matches up well with Marinelli. Um you know, Marinelli's not going to bull him over. Shields is in pretty good shape, a uh, really strong guy. I think that's a one takedown match. Wick is a lot longer. That could be more of a matchup issue. But, um, you know, Styart Marinelli, they're not going to just run through Shields. I think he's competitive with anyone here. Yeah, and I really like those those top four. Like you said, Wick is, is such an anomaly with his length and, and his size. Marinelli, obviously, the bull, I mean, I, you're right. I don't think he's going to bully Josh Shields around. Josh Shields is not one to to really to take it. But I, I would love to see a Marinelli and Wick match. If I'm being if I'm being you know selfish, I'd love to see Marinelli and Wick go at it uh, to see how how they would do. And Rob, if you look at the the rest of the weights, there's not a ton of of Pennsylvania wrestlers here. Uh, 184. You have Noah Stewart from Army, the Mifflin County native, who's 19th in the nation. He's there at 184 pounds. Um, and if you go up to heavyweight, you got Jake Gunning uh, from Buffalo, the Liberty uh, native. He'll come in as the number 13th right, right, ranked wrestler. Um, so let, let's shift gears and move over to the Southern Scuffle here. And obviously Penn State's the, the team that we're going to be talking the most of. Um, and the Scuffle takes place on January 1st and 2nd. Uh, that's a Tuesday and a Wednesday. And if you jump right off the, the bat at 125 pounds, um, you know, Nick Piccinini's there. Uh, you move up to 133, and this is a very exciting weight class for me. Dayton Fixed, Austin Gomez, and RBY. I mean, talk about three guys that have been some some of the top-ranked wrestlers in the nation for the last how many years? They're all three freshmen. Um, you know, how, how is this? How is 133? And then you throw in Corbin Myers as well. Throw him in the mix. It'll be interesting to see how they see this. Do they rank or seed Bravo Young? over Corbin Myers, or is it possible that we see Fix and Bravo Young on the same side? I mean, I'm looking over this. They might be the one and four. Um, to that point, yeah, you throw all three in the mix. Uh, Myers is a solid guy, but I think the other three are just a different level of just talent, accomplishments. I think Gomez can go with anyone here. I think everyone's kind of focused on, on Fix and Bravo Young, but I wouldn't sleep on Austin Gomez. But this is a huge test for Bravo Young. You get the people tw- uh, on Twitter chirping the flow rankings and you know, I agree with the flow guys. You can't really rank Bravo Young much higher than this. No matter how good he looks, there's no uh, objective evidence, right, which is what they go off of. So this is a chance for him to get out there and, I guess, shut everyone up and see uh, see how good he is. Uh, if we're looking at how they seed it, I mean, I'd say second or third. I don't know if he quite beats Fix. Uh, coin toss with, with Gomez, but I'd favor Bravo Young. But it should be interesting to see where he's at. Yeah, and, and I agree. I could see them – I could see – Honestly, if, if I'm looking at the seedings, I could see Fix 1 uh, and, and Gomez 2, Myers 3, Bravo Young 4 possibly and, and have that Fix uh, Bravo Young matchup in the, in the semifinals on the top half. But you, you look at a guy like um, Austin Gomez. He has a quality win over, over Austin Sano, right? They're, they'll look at that for sure. Um, RBY, and I agree with you, you know, Rob, the, the flow guys – where he's ranked is where he should be ranked because look at his body of work. I mean, yeah, it doesn't matter how good he's looked. This is his time to to prove, okay, I'm I'm for real, right? And it's not his fault that you know he hasn't really had the the high end talent, you know, guys to to compete against. But this is his time to to shine, if you will. So, uh, really looking forward to 133 pounds. Probably my my first favorite 
that I'm looking forward to is it has to be 165 because we've been and you you had talked about how we were kind of um, shafted from not seeing Tomasello and Gross wrestle. We, we've been shafted for not seeing Vincenzo Joseph and Chance Marceller wrestle yet uh, in, in college. This is one that I've been waiting for to happen because I think it's just, uh, you know, you talk about the mental aspect of this. These are two guys that are just really highly talented, very successful wrestlers on multiple levels. Um, but, man, I-, I was there at the Arizona State match. Vincenzo looked like on a different level. He's just so confident on on, on the mat. I-, I can't see anyone beating him, including Chance Marceller. I agree. I mean, you were live and in person. I saw Vincenzo over the summer. He did a clinic for us. Does he look even bigger and stronger than in the past? He he looks bigger than Mark Hall. Honestly, we were, I was talking about that with some of the the other guys on press row. I mean, he when he comes out on the mat and you see Mark Hall, I mean, they kind of look. I mean, almost like the same weight. Uh, so he looks like he has to be a big sixty five pounder. I mean, he's just he's so thick up top. And you know, Rob, you've known him since he was he was seven years old. Uh, I've known him since he was very young as well. And he's always had that kind of barrel chest, but th- the hips. Uh, the lower body, I mean, he's just very thick and it looks like he just controls the mat from, from all, I mean, he, he really just uh, controls his opponents from, from all positions. And I was very, I was very impressed with a guy um, if, what he did to Josh Shields, right? Because as you said, when we were previewing the Midlands, Josh Shields is not one to be really pushed around and bullied. Um, but on the same token, I, I think Marsteller has that same type of frame. If you look at Josh Shields and, um, these two are both freestyle heavy wrestlers, um, Chenzo and, and, and Chance. You know they both like to to go uh, a little bit higher up and and get to their leg. You know, using that to to set up their leg attacks. What what do you see happening in this match? If it happens, so if it happens, because I think you have Mikai Lewis and Chandler Rogers in there. Uh, Chance beat both those guys last year, but they're they're both dangerous, right? Mikai is he's got very good reattacks. If he gets a lead. And forces you to start shooting. He's very tough to beat. And then Rogers is just very tricky, right? He can put anyone on their back. But yeah, you know, my money says that probably Marcel and Joseph in the finals. I think Joseph wins a close match. I don't think Marcel is going to get pushed around too much. Um, Marcel has a lot of tricks, though. He might be able to sneak an early takedown and really make Vincenzo work for it. But uh, like you said, I think Vincenzo is on a different level. I think if anyone's going to push him this year, um, it might be Wick from Wisconsin, just with his length and his top ability. I think that might be his toughest matchup because he hasn't wrestled him yet. But, um, yeah, it'd be interesting to see where, where he shakes out this week. Yeah, and, and I mean, the one thing about Chenzo is he, he's not afraid to take a risk. I mean, we've seen that last year in the, the duel with Iowa, right, uh, going going toe-to-toe with, with the Bull Marinelli and losing that match. Um, you know, he's not afraid to mix it up. I, I, that's the one, the one thing that you can't teach is, is fearlessness. And he, he, he's really kind of fearless when he's on the mat. Um, you know, obviously I, Imar is a, a victim of that, but at the same time, chance, as you said, he has a lot of tricks. He's, he's a very fundamentally sound wrestler. I could see him sneaking in a takedown first in the first period. Um, but Chenzo kind of battling back, chipping away. Um, yeah, I, I, 65 just really excites me. I, I really like this 65 weight class here at the scuffle. You move up to 174 pounds, and Mark Hall is here. But you also have some some pretty quality talent guys with David McFadden, right, uh, from Virginia Tech. He's here. He comes in ranked number five. And Jacoby Smith from Oklahoma State coming in at number seven. But Jacoby Smith, is he going to be here, or is it, are we going to see Joe Smith? I don't know what they're going to do. Are they going to wrestle both Joe and Jacoby at 74? Is one going to go 84? Um, so if we're wrong on, on the preview about what weight someone's at when it comes to those two, don't bash us too hard because I don't think anyone knows. Um, but to your point, I think Hall is, is by far the best guy here. Um, though you got McFadden, Joe Smith, Jacoby. They're all studs. They're all All-Americans. I think McFadden, any way you slice it, in, in my mind, is probably the second best guy. Um, he's really solid. He's good in all three positions. But you know what, the way Hall rode Valencia, it's, it's tough to see anyone beating him. Uh, here, I think Valencia... Honestly, it's still a toss-up match when they meet in Pittsburgh, if they meet. But anyone else, I think, is really going to struggle with Hall. Yeah, yeah, totally agree with you there. I would love to see Joe Smith here, 174 pounds, and mix it up with some of these guys because he's one. I mean, he's one that, I mean, he's impressed me from from day one. You know, when he came on the scene here, um, I'd love to see him mix it up and, and see really because he we haven't seen him for quite a while. I mean, not until the the Reno, but. We haven't really seen him in quite a while, so how how is he going to fare, especially up at seventy four? It'd be interesting to see if he's here. Yeah, they said he's really big. Um, I mean, he was at fifty seven two years ago. You know those those Oklahoma State guys like to cut weight, but 
Uh, that weight's definitely going to be adjustment. You know, Hall's got to be bigger than him, but we'll we'll see how it shakes out. You move up to 184 pounds, and this one uh, really features a ton of Pennsylvania talent here, starting off with Zach Zavatsky from Virginia Tech, who we've had on the show here before. He comes in ranked number six, but Shakur Rashid from Penn State, uh, he comes in ranked number seven. Boy, is he dangerous, and he just continues to impress me uh, the way he goes out and competes. But then you throw in a, a freshman like Louis Deprez from Binghamton, Corey Hazel from Lock Haven, a Pennsylvania native, Sammy Colbray from Iowa State, and Dakota Gear from Oklahoma State, who we may not, he may not be at 84. We, there's rumors that he may be up at 97. But Rob, talk about these these top four guys here with Vatsky, Rashid, and Deprez and Hazel, and, and really where you think it, it shakes out. Looking over this, you know, I don't know to be honest. I I was about to say it looks like a clear two, but Dupre's tough. He's he's beaten Max Dean this year. Hazel's beaten Dupre. So who knows how it's going to shake out? I think honestly, you know, you put the two All Americans at the top, Zavatsky and Rashid. Um, but if either of them lost, it wouldn't surprise me. Um, if Rashid went out and pinned everyone in forty five seconds, that wouldn't surprise me either. He's just he makes it look so easy. Yeah. Um, you know. Putting money on it, I think Zavatsky's probably the best guy here. I don't know if he'll get bullied by Rashid the way he's kind of bullied everyone else. But I could see him finishing fourth, fifth as well. So it's tough to see. But, I, again, with the Penn State people complaining on Twitter about the rankings, saying Rashid should be higher, you know, he'll get his shot here, and, and we'll see how good he is. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting to hear because, like you said, the Penn State natives, I mean, the Penn State uh, fans and faithful – um, you know, they, they, they see how good these, these guys are. And I, I agree with you. Um, but now's the time to really prove that on the mat and see where you, you rank in terms of, uh, beating a guy like Zat Savaskia, an all American, um, Shakur, I think, like you said, I, I would not be surprised if he pins everyone in the first period, uh, to, to win the championship. However, Corey Hazel, I think you can't sleep on him. Um, I, I could see him sneaking in a, a few wins that he may not, uh, be supposed to, to win. Um, I, I like the way he wrestles. And as you said, he beat the prey and, um, but Zavatsky probably if I'm, I'm a betting person, right. Zavatsky has got to be the guy that I'm probably, uh, sa- that probably the safest bet. Would you agree, Rob? He's probably the safest bet. Yeah, I think so. But, um, yeah, like you said, there's the prey and Hazel, the guys are probably in the three, four spots. They're dangerous. Hazel is, I mean, he's. When he's hot, he's very good. He had Abinator on the ropes last year, um, beat the prey, but then he loses to Stewart, who's obviously very good from Army, but um, not quite at those guys' level. Now you look at 197 pounds, and this is clearly uh, Bo Nichols' weight here, and I, I, I don't see anyone even coming close to this, but uh, you had mentioned that uh, Dakota Gear from Oklahoma State, and Oklahoma State's obviously going through a little bit of a, a lineup shift, as if you will, right now. Um, there's rumors that he Dakota Gear could be up to 97. Is that correct? Yeah, he wrestled 97 in Reno, and he wrestled it at their duel versus Northern Colorado and wrestled uh, Seeley, who's probably Northern Colorado's best guy, and beat him pretty handily. It sounds like Weigel is battling an injury, and the best prospect is for them to bump up Gear, who's very tall and lean, can probably put the weight on, and then you slip either Jacoby or Joe Smith up to 84, depending on how that shakes out, which is their best lineup, uh, you know, Sands Weigel. So looking at 197, Rob, who do you who do you like here? Who do you think is going to be fighting for that spot to to meet Bo? Because it's it's you know this is Bo's weight. Uh, but who are some of the other guys you you think here that that could really make some noise? Traxler wrestled well in Vegas after losing his first match. He battled back hard. But I'm going to go on a limb and I'm going to uh, you know throw a shout out to Gear, who uh, coincidentally enough, my brother coached a little bit when my brother was up at Clarion. They had a camp, and then he'd come work out with Woodley and Bonacorsi in our room. So uh, both of us know Dakota fairly well. I say if he's on the opposite side of Nickel, he gets to the finals. Nicholas, is, he's got a lot of tricks. He's solid. But those Oklahoma State guys have seen him before. They duel Missouri a lot. Um, now he's in the Big 12. I think some of those throws and some of those tricky moves he has, gear will be ready for. You got Loizo and Slay. Yeah, Loizo, obviously very tough on top. He comes out hard but kind of fades. Slay's kind of the opposite. He's very, very plodding, not that explosive. Um, I expect both of them to place, but I don't think they'll really be pushing those top guys. Yeah, and, and you, you, I agree with you with Slay. I mean, he just kind of, like you said, he plots. He he just grinds people down, right? When you watch Slay, he just really grinds grinds out wins and really fights. Uh, I, I like the way he fights. He fights hard, and um, it, it should be interesting to see. I, I would I would very much like to see Dakota Gear up at 97, see where he's at. That's a bold statement, though, Rob, moving up a weight class and saying he's going to be in the finals of Scuffle. That's a 
that's a pretty that I don't know if if this is a if you're you know under the influence of anything right now, but that's that's a bold uh, prediction, Rob. No, I just think he's he's the better wrestler. I think bumping up to ninety seven, those guys aren't quite quite as athletic typically. Um, he's got the length, so he's not going to struggle there. I think if he's up there and he's on a full feed, I don't want to say that because it's a cop out, but I think if he wrestles there, he's going to be ready to go and he's going to put himself in the finals or be top three. You look at heavyweight here, and, and Kazar is obviously you know the the top guy, and I, I'd love to see how he competes against a guy like Derek White. But Billy Miller from Virginia Tech, a guy who used to wrestle in Pennsylvania, right? Uh, and him and Thomas Haynes used to go back and forth, right? And Thomas Haynes has, has beaten him uh, at least a few times in his career. Thomas Haynes though has kind of faded into the sunset. Uh, you know, he comes in ranked nineteenth in the the nation, while Billy Miller's eight. Could you see Thomas Haynes? You think he could maybe, uh, you know? really resurge himself here, if you will? I hope so. I mean, you look at, at Haynes and Goodhart, I think Joe and I both predicted them to All-American this year. Uh, they've both been kind of trending in the wrong direction so far. But, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what Haynes can do. He's very big um, and, and athletic and strong. With how good he was in high school, you, you'd think he'd be ready to go and, and ready to kind of put a stamp on his career. Yeah, I think you go with Miller. I think you look at the weight. A lot of these weights are very top heavy. I think you know the one and two are, are kind of defined. Um, I feel like that's the same way here with Kassar and White, but I think Haynes could certainly be in the top three. I think Goodhart should push for a medal, and you know Miller. I think his ceiling is three. Uh, he could probably finish as low as five or six, depending how he wrestles. Well, we shall see how it all pans out, uh, folks. That is your preview for what's to come in the holiday season. As we mentioned, the the Midlands, uh, the South Beach duels, and also the Southern Scuffle. Um, a lot of a lot of high quality wrestling going on here, including a ton of Pennsylvania wrestlers. So you should be focusing in on on what's going on across the nation, Rob. And we're going to kick it over to to Zeke Jones and Joe Youngblood's going to join us for that. Uh, I'm going to step away. Uh, Joe's going to actually do some of his his work and actually uh, you know provide some type of of substance to this interview. Do you think he will? I don't know. I've been trying to reach him the last ten minutes. He hasn't picked up, so he might be. Uh... On a roller coaster or eating a $20 turkey leg down in Disney. <laughs> well, at least someone's having fun, right? This week's guest, Arizona State head coach Zeke Jones. Coach, thanks for uh, thanks for joining us this week. Really appreciate you taking some time. Yeah, anytime. Glad to, um, glad to be on and uh, always good to, to be talking with you guys. Yeah, so... Uh, Rob's going to start us off here with some questions, and uh, you know we're just going to you know jab, uh, give a little banter back and forth, and uh, you know pick your brain a little bit about uh, about coaching and and uh, you know your stops along the way. Yeah, sounds good. It's uh, been a heck of a heck of a journey over time, and uh, you know you, you you put on wrestling shoes at five years old, and the next thing you know you're fifty some years old, uh, still doing the same thing that you love, and it's uh, it's a lot of fun. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, so Zeke, first question, like you said, you've been doing this since you were five years old. Obviously, you're, you're a bright guy. You were awarded the world's most technical wrestler at one point. Uh, if you have a mind like that for wrestling, you could probably do anything. What led you to get into coaching, and, and when did you know that you definitely wanted to be a coach? Well, you know, I actually got into wrestling. My brother Johnny was on a national championship team at Iowa State in 1976. Uh, he was 18 years old. I was five. He came home from college on a weekend and says, Hey, let me take you to a wrestling tournament. Showed me a half Nelson, and a double leg. And, you know, the next day I was at a tournament, I wrestled and, and never stopped ever since. Um, you know, growing up in Ann Arbor gave me the opportunity to be around some of the best wrestlers in the country, in the world, uh, you know, next to our university, my little kid's coach was Mark Johnson, right. Who was a three time, you know, big 10 finalist and NCAA finalist who coached at Illinois and uh, growing up in that environment around the university, I learned a lot. And my high school coach was on a national championship team in 1965 for Iowa State as well, Ernie Gillum. And Ernie lost in the NCAA finals to Rick Sanders, lost to Dataki Hot on the semis, uh, was second and third in the NCAA. My brother was second and fourth in the NCAAs. And Ernie just had graduated when Dan Gable came in, so they overlapped when they were still continuing to train for the Olympic Games. So, you know, you're little kids. You don't know anything. You just go to practice at five years old. But <laughs> looking back on, I was pretty blessed when I was a kid. So being around all those guys, you know, from the time you're five years old, did you know that you were going to do this sport forever and, and never leave? 
Nope, had no idea. Probably like any little kid, five years old, certain years, it was a lot of fun. Some years, it was tough and difficult. And you know, I played football and, and uh, you know, other sports, you know, baseball and like other kids. And, but I always wrestled, you know, just was something I did along with all the other sports. But what was happening was I was around greatness all the time in the sport of wrestling. But I didn't know. I just, just didn't know. I was, you know, eight years old, 10 years old, 12 years old. You're just going to practice and doing all the things that other kids do. Um, the, the real passion didn't really come for me until high school where, man, I really fell in love with the sport and got so excited about it. And the beauty was I had a tremendous amount of knowledge with me and already had a great base under my feet, right, with the years of just being coached correctly, even though, you know, I wasn't doing it year round. I was doing a few months a year at the time when you're little. But to have all that knowledge around me and expertise that, you know, the passion and the work was there, now I just needed the people to, you know, teach me the, the way. And, uh, you know, that's what happened. And then, you know, of course, from there, you know, I went on to college and wrestled. I'm talking about college and, and where this has taken you. Is it is it full circle for you coming back to Arizona State to be the head coach? Like when when that job came open, was it a no brainer for you to to jump in and, and go after it? Well, it was. You know, it, I always chuckled when when I got a call from Ray Anderson, the athletic director at Arizona State, and says, "Hey, you interested in this job?" And I said, "You know, I'm coaching the best team in the world. Why would I want to go to Arizona State at the time? They were 67th in the country." And he said, because I want to build a world-class program here. And he had just became the athletic director. Uh, Ray was just recently hired by a president named Michael Crow. Our president, you know, Arizona State's over 100,000 students and 25,000 employees and staff. He runs a small city. And he was a wrestler in high school and college, the president. So the president hired Ray. Ray's first hire was me. And from there, Ray hired three people out of the NFL that came with them. One was a wrestler. Scotty Graham was a New York high school state wrestling champ who was my new boss. So the senior associate athletic director was a wrestler. The president was a wrestler. And I knew that combined with Art Martori, right, the Sunkiss Kids Wrestling Club, the number one club in the world, and he lives eight miles from campus and is a Sun Devil himself. I said, you know, you know, like I know, if you're going to invest in something, you invest in people. And I knew the leadership was there that if I, if we wanted to do something special at ASU, the ability to do something special, we had the right leadership. And that's why, you know, I said, I'll take, you know, I'd, I'd go to Arizona state and we'd rebuild the program. And it's been a tremendous and fast slope up for us and, <laughs> until Friday, but certainly uh, we made a tremendous amount of progress in a short amount, amount of time. And I totally agree with that. And, and since you brought up Friday, wh- you know, wh- what do you take away from Friday? And, and you know, for those, uh, you know, that um, you listen out there, it, you know, coach taking some time out after, uh, you know, after his trip east and uh, where they wrestled Penn State and, and things didn't go their way. But what have you taken away from seeing what Penn State has achieved? And does it give you uh, perspective for your own program? Well, sure. I think anytime you wrestle the best team in the country, it lets you know exactly where you're at. And if you, you don't sign up for this sport and do it in 30, 35, 40 years, 50 years, without getting punched in the face a few times really, really hard. And that's the beauty of it. You know, if you look in the, in the storied tradition of the best programs and the head coaches, they've had a tremendous amount of success. We've had a tremendous amount of success. And at ASU in the last four years, the climb has been super fast with a number one recruiting class and, and a potentially another one coming up. But it really lets you know every time you really get knocked down hard, it's, you find out what you're made of. You find out what you're, you know, what you really want to do, really what your goal is. I said it's the best thing that happened to the team to let them know that if they're going to truly be a championship team, and that's what they talked about when they got here, is that's the difference. Um, it's not only to the wrestlers they have. That's a hostile environment. You know, I, I, I laughed when an hour before the match, a police officer came up and said, I'm going to be your escort for the whole dual me. Well, there's a reason I had a police escort. <laughs> it's a hostile place. I had people in my face nonstop, and I loved it. I personally loved the attack 
uh, by the people, the, the fans there, because they love their team. And I'm in, I've always thought, man, if you're going to beat somebody, beat them when they're their best. And that means when they're really trying to beat you it, versus, you know, giving me an easy win and laying down. And so it really, you know, if you're going to ever aspire to be the best of the country, the best in the world, you want the best from the best. And that was the best from the best. They gave us their best on their best day with their best people and their best environment. And you can't, you can't be mad at that. You got to love that and love to take on that challenge. So the next time you get there, you see if you make progress. And, and now you know the unknown is not unknown anymore. It's known. We know what we're dealing with. We know what we have to do. And um, so now here's, here's where the real growth and comes from you know we took 15 strokes off the golf game going from 67th in the country to 10th you know top 10 finish and a national champ in a few years which is really difficult to do but the real climb in the last couple strokes off the golf game as we know come right now when you're trying to go from 10th to first because the first place team's pretty darn good they don't want to give that spot up so there was a lot of lessons learned and we're finding out what our men have, are made of right now. And the great thing is they're made up of, of tough, strong, willed, you know, fiber. And now they've just got to go back to work and do the work, get ready to, to get a chance at it again. So, Coach, I remember when, uh, when I worked for you when I was in grad school and, and traveled to team, we went to Penn State for a dual meet and uh, when you were at West Virginia. And I remember talking with you before the match. I'm, I'm sure maybe you don't remember, but you, you – you kind of said it was tough going there then, and this was back in 2004, and you said because the fans are so knowledgeable there, and they and, and that, that was before, that was pre-Kale, that, you know, that, was, uh, that was before Kale and, and the success they've had, and you know, just you know, how much more knowledgeable are they now, <laughs> now that they that, that well, this run than they were you know, well, you know, 14 years ago? Well, how knowledgeable are they? Have my cell phone number. They know my wife's name. They know my children's name. They know <laughs> everything about me in my bio. Uh, there's a reason why I had a police, a police escort. I mean, it. They they ride you the whole way, and and it's and I'm not talking about it in the circle. You know, it's it's yeah. in the arena. But but the thing that you know, and of course, if you watch the duel, I don't react at all. I maybe even laughed a couple times at some of the things they said, uh, just because they were really trying to get get to me. But for me, it was, you know, I'm older, right? It was easy for me to block it out. But I do think our wrestlers, a couple of them might have got caught up in it, got caught up in the external. So hats off to the fans for, to, for winning that, uh, that battle. But I think, is it, is it insurmountable? No. And I'll tell you why. And, uh, of course, you know, Penn State will, you know, obviously argue that point. But in 1991, we took a Bloomsburg wrestling team into number one Penn State and beat them. Bloomsburg, 1991. Penn State was ranked number one in the country. I think we were maybe 11. And Tim Casey went in and beat Jeff Prescott, majored him, after he had won a national title and was on a, I don't know, third, kind of similar to what happened to Zed, right? And I told our team, it's, it's possible. Anything is possible if you really put your mind to it. And so to say that it's impossible, no, it's not. We've done it, actually. But <laughs> obviously the other night we didn't. And it, it, it's just a tremendous, uh, you know, hats off to how good they are. I mean, that is a really good team, but that should be the ultimate motivation, right, is when you wrestle a great team, it's your chance to really do something that no one has done before to do something special and to go into that arena in, in a hostile environment and compete hard. Um, but, man, I tell you, it's a lot of fun. They're a really good wrestling team, and it, it lets you know where you're at. So, Zeke, to that point, like you said, you spent some time at Bloomsburg, uh, UPenn, and then uh, West Virginia, which technically is in Pennsylvania, but it's right across the border. Uh, what did you learn out here? What's different about the fans, the culture, the wrestlers, than maybe the West Coast or even the Midwest? Rob, they're the best fans in the world. You know, you can't, as you know, growing up there and, uh, you know, I'm practically from Pennsylvania living out there so long and being a part of the culture and the tradition and history that, you know, there's just really uh, knowledgeable parents, coaches, there's generations of family members that have wrestled, you know, 
great grandfathers and grandfathers and fathers and sons have all wrestled in the same high school over time, have won, you know, state championships in five generations. Um, the fabric of the people are excellent. Um, you know, I, I, I look at, I even look at the Iranians, probably, you know, Pennsylvania and Iran have the best fans in the world when it comes to the sport of wrestling, because they know it so well, they love it. You know, Iran will even cheer for a great hold, even if it's done against their own guy. I've seen them cheer for the U.S. against their own guy when they hit a really nice wrestling move, that the move superseded their home loyalty because they honored the sport before they honored their own. And it's similar in Pennsylvania. Of course, they love their own, but they love the sport because of what it does for themselves. And, you know, guys like Josh Shields and Maruka who are in our program who are fantastic Sun Devils and great Pennsylvania natives, I mean, they're, they competed well that night. Um, I mean, just absolutely super. And you know why? Because they have the background, they have the families and the, uh, uh, you know, the coaches and the people that surrounded them to help them become great. So Rob alluded to, you know, where you've been and stops you've made, uh, you know, and, and with the, the three that come to mind, uh, not, you know, the colleges, not, not the national team. Uh, that's a, that's a whole nother, uh, you know, venture you took on, but, Talking about West Virginia, talking about Penn, talking about Arizona State. You had the privilege to coach Greg Jones, a three-timer, Matt Valenti, a two-timer at Penn, and uh, Zahid, who uh, his uh, you know his career is not over by any sense of imagination, but you know is uh, has made has already reached a pinnacle and has a lot of wrestling left in front of him. Maybe two parts to this question: what what similarities do they possess uh, as far as like mental makeup and how are they different? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, you know, you, you go a long coaching career and you get several special people that come into your coaching life as athletes. And certainly Greg Jones at West Virginia and Matt Bellani at Penn and uh, Greg here at Arizona State. It, I mean, it's just an amazing opportunity to see greatness occur, uh, to really actually do it in some ways in different ways. Uh, you know, they had unique gifts. Uh, it, it, some things were similar, like, uh, you know, Zahid and Greg were excellent on their feet. They were tremendous superstar athletes. Matt Bellini was very workmanlike, very detailed and technical. Um, and to not say the others weren't, I mean, you can't win three national titles and not know any moves, right? You gotta, you gotta understand the sport inside and out. Man, Matt was tremendous on the top and bottom. He reversed everybody. He rode everybody and no one could take him down. Um, and he could score takedowns when he needed them. Greg and, and, uh, Zahid have world-class speed. Uh, Greg was, a, Greg has, the beauty of Greg was he had talent but he didn't, um, he, he was insulted if you said, Greg, Greg, you just win because your God gave you the gift of, of world class speed. Greg worked his talent. Greg honored his talent through hard work and through commitment. So he does the same thing, but in a different way. He works as hard as he could possibly work. I mean, the guy's a tremendous worker. Um, you know, he does it for different reasons. I don't think it's because he necessarily wants to honor his talent and he doesn't want to be, he doesn't want people to say the only one because you're gifted. He wants people to say he's gifted because he wrestles a relentless style. He's all over you. He's, uh, he's, you know, he goes a hundred miles an hour and takes a thousand shots and he will out compete you. Um, maybe it's in a different way, but to say that, um, they all share the unique gift of being extremely competitive, uh, the desire to do the work and the passion that it takes to be the best in the country. And, um, man, I tell you, you're talking about some special people right there. Yeah, I know. Uh, I know what you mean about Greg. Uh, you know, I, I was again, I was privileged just to witness firsthand the amount of work he put in and the the talent that he displayed was it. It just didn't didn't he didn't snap his fingers and it happened. It didn't happen overnight. I mean, he was a he was a guy that put in a ton of work to make it happen. And uh, so, 
uh, uh, you know, he talked about Zahid about out competing, and you know, he you know he, he came out on the on the on the wrong end of a four nothing decision to Mark Hall, who they've gone back and forth. I went on when we previewed your match. I went on on our podcast last week, and I thought for sure, I you know, if I if I was a betting man, I said that he would have been a slam dunk. Where where did you know where do you feel the match went wrong for him, and how much do you think the environment played a factor? Yeah, I think it's a uh, yeah, it's a great question. Um, Zahid is, uh, you know, obviously he's he's going to go down as one of the all time greats. I believe, you know, of course he's still got, you know, this the second half of his career he's working through. Um, yeah, I want to make excuses for him, you know, because that's one thing he you'll never hear him do, right? He, he's not going to make a bunch of excuses and and point at all the reasons why things went wrong. I think he's just in the start of his preparation. I think he hasn't quite had the minutes he needs yet. Uh, I think it showed up. I do think, and it was interesting, I've never seen an environment really getting only a, a few times. I'd say that when, when he does lose, um, it is either it's the lack of preparation for whatever reason it is, not work ethic, guy loves to work, um, preparation, and then also I think the energy, you know, managing his energy before he competes. I even think when he wrestled Dake in the same arena in the summer, I think his, he probably could have managed his energy a little bit right before the match. Uh, started warming up way earlier than he ever does. I actually had to pull him back out and say, hey, you never warm up this early. And he came and sat back down. But he's only because he wanted to get out of the gate and go, um, which isn't a bad thing, but it's, you got to manage it at the right time. Um, he's usually really good in tough environments, but that's why you wrestle the matches. That's why you play the game. It's why you – you know, you shoot the ball is because is a guy a hundred percent every day, day in and day out. And for all the different reasons that he wasn't, um, that's the beauty of sport in general. But I, I used to tell Greg this, and it's the same thing with the heat. My goal is to ensure you lose every year. You're so good. It's hard to get you beat, but it's, if we can get you beat, you learn from it. The best, and I'd even say that was one of Kale's gifts. We, you know, of course he had an undefeated college career, but Kale was always bet, his best after a loss. The same thing with Greg Jones. He would always, I would always take him to the Dunkist Open. I'd have him wrestle World Olympic medalist while he was still in college, and he'd lose close matches. And then he'd just kind of get the monkey off his back, and then he'd go through a college season undefeated and. Uh, and even then I was trying to find ways to get him beat. The same thing with Zahid in that he needs that same thing. Losing is extremely healthy for him. Uh, of course, not a lot of it, right? But it, what it does is it's a reminder. It's a reminder of the things that got you there. And it's easy. And I don't care if you're Jordan Burroughs. I've watched the best in the world do it. Guys that win NCAA World Olympic gold medals, same thing. You win enough your brain changes and in your external environment, as much as you like to not let it affect you probably is affected him more than, you know, his mindset is changing, right? Guy hasn't lost in a very long time, you know, in the college world, right? Since his freshman year. And it's just a good reminder of how you got there. And, um, I just look in his eyes now. It's the best thing that happened to him. Cause I'm telling you this guy, he's going to come back extremely motivated. So, uh, and I can already see it. I already know it. I can just, I'm looking at his body language. So, um, the beauty of losing to someone like these guys is it makes them better. And, um, I think it's, it's great for him on the match just specifically. And I guess I didn't comment on that. Mark's great guy knows how to wrestle. He's a winner too. Right. I, you know, I spend every summer with Mark and Zahid and it's the stuff you guys don't get to see. I see them all summer long. They train together in the summer, right? Cause they're both on the junior world team virtually every year, uh, Mark's a, a competitor. You know, he, he knows how to win. He knows how to get up. He knew how to, he took advantage of all his tools this weekend and he got his job done. He did what he was supposed to do. He's well coached. He's a bright guy. And, uh, that's the beauty of this chess game. You know, it's not life or death. It's wrestling, but it's beautiful. That's why we're all on this, uh, you know, call today and talking to the people about the beauty of our sport and it's Mark Calls and Zahid Valencia's rivalry, which will make us entertained, but it'll bring the best out of them in this brilliant chess match of their careers. 
Yeah, great, great answer, Coach, and you know, give tremendous insight about these these guys. And changing gears a little bit, talking about like recruiting, and you know, since we're a, a uh, you know a, a PA power podcast, we got to ask what how is important how important is it to you to get Pennsylvania kids into your program? You know, you talked about the generations of of wrestling in the state and the the, the fans and everything, and you know. what you you have some guys from Pennsylvania roster right now. You're linked to some more, and that you know some future uh, possible future recruits. How important is that to you to to land these guys and and have have that type of wrestler in your in your program? Oh, it's it's essential. It's critical. It's mandatory. Um, you know, we flew home after the Penn State duel. Guess where I was yesterday? I flew back to Pennsylvania. Um, I was back along that area recruiting again. Uh, and it's because one, it's like family to me. I know the quality of the families there, you know, living there essentially, you know, 15, 20 years of coaching my life there. I have a lot of families and friends and people that are close to me, uh, that are there that, um, send their wrestlers to us. You know, I, I use, um, Matt Levy, who wrestled as you, as you know, Joe at West Virginia, with me was an all American and Matt, who which is now at Franklin regional coach Maruka and shield. And they could have went anywhere in the country. You know, shields had a great offer from Penn state. You can go up and down the line of how many schools recruited both of them, all of them, right. All the good ones out of there. Matt sent shields and Maruka to me because I think it cuts through recruiting, right? If Matt did not have a good experience with me coaching him, why would he send Maruka and shields here? He said to Maruka and Shields, you need to go to Arizona State because Coach Jones will help you. He believed that we would help those two uh, like I did him. And if you're getting second-generation wrestlers uh, coming to you, that tells you they were treated fairly and with respect and kindness, and you helped them achieve their goals. And, um, you know, that's obviously what we're trying to do with Josh and Josh right now. But I also think that, there's a reason why guys like Matt coach Levy and as well as Merck and shields and the others that are coming out of there is they're just tremendous students and athletes and humans. You know, I believe the defining marker of success is character, you know, that, uh, you know, I love talent. I love world-class speed, but what's going to win over time is kids that have great character and make good decisions and are, have good families. And, and that's why we go there because the Pennsylvania kids, have that and that's why we're there and that's why we're communicating all the time uh there we have a a strong connection between pennsylvania and arizona state and it's really just fun to watch the growth in in guys like shields and maruka too because um I, i think like my own experience you know i'm a sun devil i've been a sun devil but i've also been a coach essentially from pennsylvania for 20 years and I've learned a lot about the East and the West. I've learned a lot about the United States. I've learned a lot of, as you know, Zahid and Anthony are from California and Tanner's from Idaho. We truly have a global, you know, a national domestic program where you see different beliefs, you see different cultures and environments. And in today's world, it's getting real small. I mean, I'm sure you follow people on Instagram from Iran and Russia, right? I mean, the world is getting small now. And I think Josh... Maruka and Josh Shields are going to be better equipped for today's world because they have different viewpoints than just one location of the country. They have teammates from all over. They've been all over. Josh Shields was in Puerto Rico serving with his church. I mean, to just, you know, being in Cuba to wrestle and train. They're getting such a global, fantastic, nationwide, national view. And I think it's because you know, we, we value the differences in people and wanting to have a multicultural environment to, um, you know, I just think that we make better people when they see, you know, kids from all over the country and share their same, the same love and passion and desire to be the best in the country in the sport of wrestling, but also, uh, you know, to learn about people and, and the growth that you make because of you learning about other people. And so it's really, um, it's important that we're in Pennsylvania love the place, been there, can't tell you how many All-Americans and national champs we've had, uh, you know, from a great state of Pennsylvania, and, you know, and now they want to be Sun Devils, and it's been a lot of fun to be a part of that journey with them. 
St- uh, sticking with recruiting, what do you look for in a kid that when you are recruiting them? You know, looking over it, I can tell you probably like guys that wrestle the international styles for obvious reasons. Schultz, Tiber, the Valencias, Hall, all have had uh, international success. Is that a, a big criteria for you or just in general? What do you look for when you're getting after someone? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, the first thing is the best recruiting is done by word of mouth, that you guys are the people that I'm calling and talking to because, you know, you can read brackets to your blue in the face, but when you call somebody and say, I saw a kid who won a state title or you know, I heard about this kid, you, know, you, you guys know him. So I can generally right away find out the type of character and family and the quality of student and athlete that they are before we even call them. Um, you know, we're certainly going to talk to more than just, the wrestler, we're going to talk to the parents and their friends and their coaches, the people around them, because I know that you're going to learn. More. Heck, I'm going to call the enemy. Even the enemy will say, man, I hate wrestling that guy, but he's a good guy. People like him. He's, he's a good human, even though I hate wrestling him. You know, when you hear something like that, you know you've got a kid that you want to really take a good hard look at. You know, first thing, too, we're looking for kids that have great grades. We have tremendous academic aid at Arizona State. So kids that have good GPAs and good test scores, they can get a lot of scholarship money even before we start talking about, you know, athletic scholarship. So we're looking for that too. Uh, I tend to go back to the guys that uh, have wrestled for me, you know, guys like Virtus Jones and, or, or with me, you know, around me, Jim Akerley to, you know, Virtus and Matt and the guys that, Whitey and the guys that are on the East Coast coaching some of the best kids in the country. They tend to know everybody. Um, and so we go to those places because we know the quality of the student, the athlete. Uh, but like I told you, that character, you know, the defining marker of success is character. And we were looking for those kids. And, you know, for us too, as you know, we're, you know, we're a highly uh, motivated freestyle program. So we're not looking for kids that just want to be the best in the country. We're looking for kids that want to be the best in the world. And that's why we're signing the Colton Schultz's, the Zahid Valencia's, you know, the top recruits in the country are choosing to come to Arizona state because they want to be the best in the world. And you guys know to be the best in the world, you got to have world-class coaching and training partners and a university that's committed to seeing you be the best in the world. And so we tend to attract those kids and, um, but not always. I mean, kids like Busiello, as you know, they're, you know, multiple times state champs. They're not a lot of freestyle background. That's okay too. We need that mix of, of that folk style top and bottom and kids that want to win four national titles. So, you know, we attract a little bit of everything, but, um, you know, those are the things that we're looking for. And, you know, we're always looking for the next Pennsylvania kids. So on that same topic of recruiting coach, you know, this is like a hot topic these days. And you see a lot of coaches commenting on it from, from all sports, uh, parent involvement. Is there, is there ever been a situation where a, a parent got involved with the recruiting process that kind of, kind of rubbed you the wrong way where, you know, you felt that it, bringing that, that particular wrestler in that athlete in could mean more headache for you from the parental end of it, not the, not the wrestler end. Well, I think it's, you know, when you're, when you're signing a wrestler, you're signing the family and the community and the coach. I always believe that because I want them to be a part of our program, the parents and the high school coaches and their families, because it's more fun. It's better that way, I think. But, um, yeah, has it, has it ever turned me away? Uh, yeah, I think that's why you call it recruiting. It really recruiting is, is just getting to know each other, right? Is this a good fit for each other? And what might be a good fit for one parent and a, and a college coach might not be a good fit for another. Um, you know, we've had fantastic families in a part of our program. And I have to say, I can't think of any parent that's ever been a challenge for us, but I think it's probably been because we scrutinized that decision. Just like even those parents will say, I don't know if this is the right fit for my son, uh, this, this type of coaching staff, and it doesn't make it wrong. It's just maybe fit sometimes, but, um, you know, have I seen it? Yes. But, you know, I haven't really had to live it and experience it because I think we probably do our homework before we get there. All right, changing, changing gears again, having a little, maybe a little bit of fun. So you spend time in, in Morgantown, West Virginia, and you know, I'm just wondering how much do you miss Keglers there? <laughs> I tell you, that chicken sandwich, what was the name of that thing? Uh-huh. I was talking to Whitey about It's unbelievable. I love that thing. Um, what was the name of it? Uh, uh, miss I Keglers. I miss 
Go ahead. No, I was say I remember we we were watched the uh, Eagles Patriots Super Bowl in two thousand four. Uh, there it was me, you, and 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 Whitey watching it with our uh, you know Carly was down and you know Renee was there and Whitey and Stacy were there, so it was uh, it was fun. Like you know all that big group of people enjoying the Super Bowl. No, it's a lot of fun. I love Kegler's, their chicken wings. You know, I met my wife there. I had my son there. Of course, I've raised three other children that are around the country. You know, I have daughter, you know, that they were all from Morgantown and were born and raised there. And uh, just a fantastic place to raise a family. And uh, I miss those days, man. It's been a while. Yeah. So then when you left Morgantown, you went to Penn and you, you spent time in Philadelphia. And I, I asked this question of Matt Acevedo when we had him on earlier in the uh, fall in the preseason. When you were there, did you have your favorite cheesesteak place? Yeah. Well, I, and I don't know if it's there anymore. Concord Pike was over by my house down there, Delaware County uh, to the south. But uh, I always liked Geno's. It was good, you know, obviously of, of the two famous ones, Geno's and Pat's. I always liked Geno's. Uh, it was a tremendous place to coach because I learned a lot about uh, you know, the student athlete and, um, a lot of, and it's actually been interesting. We've recruited quite a bit against the Ivy league here at Arizona state. And we have the number one honors college in the nation. The Barrett's honors college is the number one honors college in the country. Average ACT is a 29 GPA is a 3.9. I mean, it's, it's similar. We have 6,000 students. I kind of call it our mini Dartmouth. It's, it's certainly not an Ivy league school, but the, the same, level of academic student that you'll see in the Ivy League, you'll see in the Barrett's Honors College, about 6,000 students. 50% of the kids that get accepted into the Ivy League still choose to come to the Barrett's Honors College at Arizona State because of its academic rigor and excellence. And that background for me came by coaching at Penn and working with the tremendous student athletes, athletes that they had there. And our president essentially created a small Ivy League school at Arizona State to be able to service some of the students who said, you know what, I want a world-class education and wrestling program and can do that at Arizona State, but Penn gives that environment. And I do miss the cheesesteak, though, i got to tell you that. Zeke, you mentioned the Honors College. Now, a thing we usually like to wrap it up with, like, give us your pitch. I mean, you get a kid on campus at Arizona State or you want to get a kid to come visit, but what's the sell there? Obviously, the weather – the wrestling, the honors college, and uh, I heard the girls aren't bad looking either. But um, you know, what's your sell to uh, to most guys? <laughs> yeah, I think you you pretty much hit all of them right there. I, you know, without repeating them all again, it you know we we have nine kids on our roster that are in the Barrett's Honors College. More than twenty seven sports, it's, we're number one of twenty seven sports at Arizona State in terms of how many Barrett's Honors College students we have on our roster. It matters to us. We want excellent students in our program that want to be the best in the world in the wrestling mat. Um, obviously, the one thing that was hard in the 80s, because we had no social media, no internet, is we couldn't show you all the fantastic pictures. I never had been farther than Iowa. I grew up in Michigan, right? And never went farther in Iowa on a plane until I made my visit to ASU. And I thought I was going to see tumbleweeds and Got, you know, cowboys riding down on horses. And when I got to Phoenix, I mean, it's, it's a city, right? I mean, Tempe is a suburb of, the, of Phoenix. And I'm sure you guys, have, and I, I'll start sending you some pictures. I mean, just the fantastic sunsets and palm trees and warm weather. And, and it's great for my wife and my family on a Sunday where they can enjoy the pool right now in December. You know, for me, I just need a smelly wrestling room. But I got to tell you that, you know, on a Sunday, I can throw my football to my son in December and we can go swim in the pool which is just a really bizarre concept, right, during wrestling season. But we have that there or here. And um, the great thing is you can have championship caliber wrestling program and you can have world-class coaches and training partners and get an excellent education and do it in a fantastically beautiful place. And, um, you know, that's what we're sharing with the kids that want to, you know, truly aspire to have that type of, challenge right to be the best in the country in the world and get a fantastic education enjoy the, the beauty of arizona and uh, we got a sunset coming down right now it's just fabulous and you know it's just um it's a really pretty cool environment but i can't explain it nearly as good as you witnessing it in person well you know uh, rob um, we have to we have to make our way out to tempe sometime soon after that uh that explanation yeah i need to check my eligibility real quick Come on, come on. We'll take you on a nice tour of campus. All right. 
that you know, it's it, just in case you're wondering, it's uh, it's dark and dreary here in uh, Pennsylvania. So I, you know, that, if that makes you feel any any better uh, about your sunset and and the warm <laughs> weather and going in the pool, uh, you definitely made me uh, a little bit jealous there, but. Coach, we really appreciate the time you taking out of uh, your busy schedule and, you know, with recruiting and getting ready for, you know, the holiday and the break and everything. Uh, can't, again, can't, can't begin to thank you enough for it and really appreciate coming on. No, nah, it's great. You guys do a fantastic job, Joe, Rob. Appreciate you guys having me on, you know, Pennsylvania's family to me, and I appreciate you guys giving us uh, the opportunity to share a little bit of our, our program way out here on the southwest part of the country but uh you know as much as i'd love to move arizona closer to pennsylvania uh sometimes i like the distance because it keeps the nice warm us in the nice warm weather but uh it is uh the world's getting smaller it's just fabulous to be a part of um you know the successful history and tradition of our pa kids and you guys are doing a good job man keep it up love to uh help you in any way i can so let me know all right great coach thanks and appreciate it So that will wrap it up for another week here on The Open Room with Rob and Joe. Thanks for tuning in, and as always, visit PAPowerWrestling.com for all your wrestling needs. Follow us on Twitter at PAPowerWrestle. Give us a thumbs up on Facebook and check us out on Instagram. Don't forget, fans, you can subscribe to the PA Power Podcast on iTunes and listen to all three shows on Spotify. If you want to send any questions or suggestions for the show, email us at collegetalk at PAPowerWrestling.com. Again, thanks and have a great week, fans. (laughs) 